Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8. We're going to look at several short vignettes that are all stacked together in this passage that immediately follows the Sermon on the Mount. And as I told you, the Sermon on the Mount is a message from Jesus that we should read over and over again. For today, and this is an artist rendition of a leper who's come before Jesus, an untouchable, and yet Jesus touches the untouchable. When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. According to the ritual requirements of the law, a leper could be declared clean and free from the disease only after an examination by a priest and the offering of sacrifices. And so if you want to look in all of chapter 14 Leviticus, you can see the context here that this leper comes before the Messiah. Not the priest at the temple who would have to go outside to go examine one who had been declared leprous to see if he or she is now clean and can be ceremonially cleansed. This leper comes before Jesus, kneels before him and says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. What is God's will? What is God's will? I had a brother with multiple sclerosis. He was a track star. He was the hero of our family. Six foot two as a teenager. The hero of our family. Firstborn son. His sisters on both sides. Very proud of him. His little brothers. He was just the big brother that everybody wanted. He was kind to us. He was talented. He was a track star. And he had a rock band. When he was 16 years old, he had been invited to play with the old guys. The 18-year-old, 19-year-olds. He got to play in that band. He was gifted. And we were so proud to have this big brother. Yes, his mother had died when he was a little boy, too. He was several years older than me. And he had gotten baptized before his mother died, our mother. But when he's 16, 17 years old, going to church wasn't part of our lifestyle any longer. The head of our house, our father, had delved into work. A good provider, never abused the family, didn't run around with women or drink. But what he did was work from uh, before we would get up in the morning, he would leave and he wouldn't get back usually till 1030 or 11 o'clock at night. A good man, but not much of a father image other than a father who's absent, one who provides, but not one who is personal, not one to give counsel, not one to lead the family in the ways of the Lord. So although we respected that man, we didn't look to him for counsel. We looked at him more as a taskmaster on Saturdays. If you didn't want to work, make yourself scarce. Because dad liked to work and put the boys to work on Saturday when he would be around. So we would make ourselves scarce. And that carried over into our understanding of God, the Father. One who starts some things and then goes off and we don't see him and... Maybe he's too busy. Maybe he's not that interested. And some of you have similar situations. Then again, some of you have very intimate relationships with your earthly father. And it is a blessing if your father knows where you are, even in the sanctuary today. If your father knows where you're at, what you're doing, paying attention to those signs, what's going on in your life. Are you tender toward the things of God or are you disinterested? Yeah, my brother was the hero of our family, not the dad. And so I emulated my brother rather than my father. Then at age 19, after going into the Air Force, he was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis for the first time in his life. Something physical happened and it wasn't when he was middle-aged or old-aged. 
younger than some of you sitting here today. One day, staff sergeant in the military, because of his height, because of his demeanor, his leadership ability, made staff sergeant early on, and yet flesh, the disease, the sickness of this world impacted that young body. And he was paralyzed. Later he would have remission. He would live another 11 years. But the last three years of his life would be spent being spoon-fed, cranked up in a, a lift to be transferred from wheelchair to car or into bed or into his easy chair. What is God's will? See, I heard this message right here. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And the faith healers that I took my brother to go see said, the Lord is always willing to heal the sick. Jesus healed everybody who came to him. And so as a young Christian... See, after my brother's sickness hit him, we both wandered around in darkness. But he had been the baptized Christian. I hadn't been. I just had a little five-year-old's understanding of God's Word. And if you have five-year-olds in the church today, ask yourself, could they survive without you? If you're the one bringing them to church, would their knowledge, based on what they received in Sunday school class, at the age of five, that compiled knowledge, would they know enough to get them through your death? Today's the day of salvation. Today's the day to train up your children in the way they should go. See, and I thought I had an understanding of Christianity. So then I could later, 20 years later in college, study Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, Confucius, and make a syncretistic religion for myself. And I thought I understood Christianity. I didn't. I did not know that Jesus made an exclusive claim. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And there's no other way. I didn't know Jesus had said that. These days, they say, don't believe everything you read on the internet. Those days, we didn't have the internet. But you don't need to believe everything you read in a college textbook or everything a college professor writes up on the board. All those years later, living through my brother's sickness, and I, getting saved in the last couple years of his life, praying by faith that the Lord would heal him miraculously. We wanted our lives to be back to what it was. And I prayed fervently in those early days as a Christian. And I believed what I heard in church. The Lord is always willing to heal the sick. So if there was somebody that had a lot of faith, I would put myself in that place of a humble disciple, reading the word on my own, listening to teachings from different places, but also watching and scratching my head. Is this really your will, Lord? What is your will? It wasn't what is God's will for my life. What is God's will for my brother's life? But some of you are asking that about your own life today. Lord, what's your will? What is your perfect and pleasing will in this matter? Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. The man who had come and knelt before him. Jesus said, I am willing. Be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. I think this is interesting. John, did you imagine this is where we were going to be in the scriptures today? So you picked about the leper spot. We, you didn't know that verse was in there especially? Uh-huh. Okay, well, I liked hearing that. You see, the leper spots... This is what makes him unclean. But those leper spots apparently could go away so that the priest, according to the regulation given to Moses, the priest could go outside the camp and go examine him to see if he's clean. There's more than just sickness involved here. There's the sense of being on the outside, untouchable. You see, in a church this size, 
there might be somebody who's been in prison. And it might not be one of those nice little crimes. Whatever that is. There are untouchables around us. People we'd rather not be around. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. And then Jesus answered his question. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus said, I am willing. Be clean. Immediately, this man was cleansed of his leprosy. If this was the sermon preached to me in those early days when I brought my six foot two brother into the sanctuary of the big church, I wheeled him right up front and then one of the deacons or somebody came up and tapped me on the shoulder and said, we can't have the wheelchair up in the front row. It's blocking people's view. Because he was so tall and he had a, he had, his head would flop around. He had to have an extension for his head. You know, that kind of troubled me. I didn't get all mad and leave the church because I was there for healing, but I think maybe they let us push over to the side or something so we wouldn't block the view of the people sitting behind us. I love reading God's Word. I listened that night and I went to a few different services like this when somebody would come to town who claimed to have this spiritual gift of healing. And I read about it in the list of spiritual gifts. It was there. Jesus said to this man, see that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Don't tell anybody, but just like Leviticus 14 said, go show yourself to the priest. Don't tell anybody. Now this, this is of interest to me right now as I, just, as I just collide these two passages of Old Testament scripture together with what Matthew tells us happened in this day. It's not a case of somebody else going and reporting to the priest. Uh, the man who once had leprosy is clean now. Will you come and examine him? You go. Just what Jesus tells you to do. Go. Show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. There's some secrecy involved here, but there's a direct command of the Lord. What to do next after Jesus cleansed him? After Jesus made that which is, in man's eyes, untouchable, clean and whole. One that we should open our arms and embrace again. Another vignette. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home, paralyzed, suffering terribly. This is a centurion, so what does that mean? He belongs to the Roman system. I mean, he's really an outsider, a Gentile, and yet he comes to the Jewish Messiah and he calls him Lord. So what is this man this important man, centurion, as I understand, had a hundred men under his charge. What is he doing calling a Jewish man Lord? He is voluntarily submitting himself to this man's authority. Lord, he said, my servant. He doesn't say the volunteer who's working along with me. He says my servant. He's been put in my charge. Not my slave, because he's just a man in a chain of command. Maybe like a father is over his children. Not slaves, but there's an ordained authority. The father, who, who has studied God's word, knows I have responsibility. I can't just take my hands off and say, well, it's their free will. If the kids don't want to brush their teeth, I'm not going to force them to brush their teeth. I mean, if they, if they don't want to go to sleep, I'm not going to make them go to sleep. 
There's not going to be any curfews because I don't want to. They might not sleep later in life. I got forced to go to sleep when I was a kid, so I'll never sleep again. See, sometimes we fall for some ridiculous ideas. Fathers need to be so close to the Lord that they know how to minister to each child under their charge and not abdicate responsibility for those precious ones. I like this centurion, though. He cares about a single soul man out of a hundred. One is lying paralyzed and is suffering terribly. He might be Roman and he might be a centurion, but man, he has a shepherd's heart for one of his little lambs. And he doesn't take lordship upon himself. He submits himself to the greater authority, Lord. <laughs>